the New York Times, Becky Klein. Have you all seen the exhibit? Yes. I thought this. Hey, it was, did you enjoy it? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. good. Well, um, that's our newest and, and latest and greatest, and so I wanted to kind of talk to you a little bit tonight. You know, we do these presentations, and I know I'm going to be doing quite a few presentations in the next uh, few months for the Bowers. We have a, a great schedule of programming. But um, most of the people that are going to be coming to see the exhibit don't even know what an archives is, let alone what the Disney archives is. And I know this group is not that group. <laughs> so I thought, I want to do something special tonight just for you guys and, and take a, like, like Justin said, a deep dive into the Walt Disney Archives Exhibitions Program. Um, because it hasn't always been around. He said about 15 years, he's been just about right. Uh, 14 years, I think, to be exact. Uh, we started, I started at the Walt Disney Archives in 1993. I started with Disney in 1989, so I've been with Disney for about four years before I got into the archives. And um, to give you a little background information on what the archives was like when I got there, there was four of us. And um, the archives, when it was founded in 1970, was mostly a kind of a document collection. We had dimensional things like books and uh, records and, and animator models, things like that. We had, we had dimensional things, awards. But most of the things in the collection were flat and fit in nice little drawers. And people would come into the archives to do research, and they would look at, at mostly at our document collections. And we had a few dimensional things. Now, when, you, when I talk about dimensional things, I'm talking about mostly sets, costumes, props, ride vehicles, actual vehicles, things like that. We had one rack of costumes. There was 15 costumes on it. And we had uh, one... Dave didn't take any props unless they were small enough to fit in a box, basically. <laughs> And the reason for that was because when Dave started the archives, he had limited budget and he had limited space. The problem with archives is that, you know, stuff just keeps coming. You know, we've been doing this for 50 years and, and every day we get new things in. And you always got to have somewhere to put it. And that's the problem most archivists face is you got to have, you have limited time, limited budget, and limited space. So you got to make it count. And uh, so one of the things that we've, you know, weren't able to do were exhibits. Having said that, we would loan some of our art, some of our documents, some of our smaller things. We would loan them out to other museums. But when I started at the archives, we had one exhibit case in our reading room, and it looked like that. <laughs> Donald Duck orange juice products. Um, it was Donald Duck frozen fruit. You know, you know, and I know everybody's interested in Donald Duck frozen flounder and, and lime cola. <laughs> but it was in that case for a, quite a long time. It sat in the reading room, and that was the only exhibit we had in there. We also had a second one, and this was our merchandise case. Now, the, the fun thing about this, and I, you know, when I gently poke fun at Dave Smith, it's because I worked for him for 30 years. And he, he liked things to stay the same quite often. And so this merchandise case looked exactly that way from 1971 until we moved into the Frank Wells building in 1997. And um, literally, one of my jobs as his assistant and secretary was to dust the merchandise cabinet. And so I would take everything out, but he made me take Polaroids of it first so that I could put everything in exactly the way it was. And so it stayed that way till 1997. And actually beyond that, if you want to know the truth. Um, so we had a few other cases there. When we moved into the Frank Wells building in 1997, we bought some new cases and we put in a few things. Now this was a tribute to Walt, so there was the Walt case and it had things about his trains and it had uh, some of his awards and other, you know, some scripts and, and his passport and things like that. It was very, a very nice case, but it was also there for, you know, 15 years. And, and then uh, we added a prop display and this was kind of fun. This had you know, things like the bed knob from bed knobs and broomsticks, and it had the ring from the shaggy dog, and it had the Wheeler mask from Return to Oz, because everybody wanted to see that. And um, <laughs> we would add a few things periodically, like you know, the guns from the black hole, and we had, you know, but you can see these are all little teeny tiny pieces, and they were small enough to fit into a box. And so Dave would say yes when, when somebody at the studio would give him one. Um, he, he didn't take big things, is the idea. And so this is what the exhibits of the Walt Disney Archives looked like for a very long time, from 1997 in the Frank Wells Building to 2006. And in 2006, things changed a bit. We had always been a department of the um, corporate. We were a corporate entity. 
but the archives kind of fell under different groups. So for a while we were part of the legal department and for a while we were part of, uh, I think we were part of licensing for consumer products. I think we were, we were corporate and synergy pro and special projects. We were a very special project. And then eventually they put us under HR, which was a little weird, um, mainly because we helped so much with tours and orientation. So they thought, well, let's put them under HR. So that was kind of strange. And then in, in 2006, we got a very special thing happen. They put us under corporate communications, which I think was a much better fit. And so at that time, our, our senior leaders kind of gave us more budget money. They gave us bigger quarters. They gave us an actual warehouse and things, to, places to put things and gave us, you know, tasked us with like doing some things with, with these assets and sharing them. Now we had always loaned them out to other people, so there's things at the Smithsonian that we've been, you know, loaning them for years, and and other parts of the company would have special exhibits, and so we'd loan things for that. And WDI did traveling exhibits and the animation research library, and they would borrow things from the archives, but we never actually put on our own exhibits. And so in 2006, we started kind of amassing a, a collection that we could exhibit, and uh, started looking into the things that we already had. Uh, so we branched out with those things, and we started by doing it on the lot. So we looked around and found all the little cubby holes and little tiny exhibits that already existed on the lot and basically took over those cases and refreshed them and started putting things in that we were collecting. A uh, little story about that, you know, like I said, we had 15 costumes when we started. We now have multiple thousands of costumes and we needed a place to share them and show them. So we had some cases built in the lobby of the Wells building. We had cases built in the studio theater. So we change those out periodically. So when you come to a screening, you see our little cases there. Um, but it, we decided we wanted to do something a little bit bigger. We did an actual theme display. So our first event was in December of 2006, and we did this incredibly lavish cost, uh, <laughs> Christmas exhibit with items from the Santa Claus. And you can see we spent a lot of time fixing the backgrounds and putting up, you know, <laughs> Disney, um, you know, things up to Disney standards. Uh, we, we put tablecloths out, you know, and uh, we put boxes under the fabric, so that was good. So we got some height there. And so we did some really, you know, elaborate things like putting out Santa's list and letting it drape off the table and, you know, very, very highly uh, skilled exhibits. It was our very first one. Uh, so a little later, we got a little more fancy. We started putting up fabric over the windows, and we did... Um, Pocus Pocus in the Hyperion bungalow. Now, did anybody see any of these? Did you see these? Oh, good. That's great. So we brought out some of our favorite art artifacts from the Hocus, from Hocus Pocus, and it was about this time that we started going to the prop and costume department at the studio, and they were going to shut those down. ABC took over kind of the management of the lot, and the movie business has changed so much. It used to be that you had a costume department, you had a prop department, and everybody would go there and get what they needed, and that changed when they started um, the studio system kind of ended and people would the production companies would go out and get what was needed for their show and so you didn't have these prop and costume departments that were you know that everybody used and so at that point ABC decided to shut down the costume and prop department and so they called us and said you know we're gonna just you know get rid of all this stuff so do you want to come look through our collections here and see if there's anything you want to take and thank goodness we had been given warehouse space and money so we went out and we took all these props and costumes and things that they had stored in these locations. And then we also started working with the parks. Um, Disney Hollywood Studios had a lot of things that they had squirreled away after their exhibits down there. And they were really happy when they found out. They were afraid to return them to the studio because they thought they would disappear forever. And they were really excited when we started this program. And so we were able to get a lot of this stuff from the 90s and to the present from, from Disney's Hollywood Studios. So we started showcasing these things and sharing them with the studio exhibits. And they've gotten a little more elaborate over the years. So now we're doing D23 events for Halloween and Christmas uh, often. And so we started you know, putting in real lighting. That was pretty exciting. And, uh, and share you know, things that light up, like the, the bride's heart, you know, to have it beat. Things like that was pretty exciting. Uh, I'm going to step back in time a little bit here and share with you something that's near and dear to me is the front cases of the Walt Disney Archives. Now you saw our little exhibit um, about, our little kind of exhibit within the exhibit for Disneyland in, the, uh, in our exhibit here. And that's based on these cases. We change these cases out periodically. But in 1997, when we went into that building, we were the first people to move into the building. 
and we had the, they built these beautiful cases and lit them up with our name on the top. Uh, but we had no idea how to put together an exhibit, none. I had to call the studio operations people just to hang the fabric for us. We had no idea what we were doing, but we you know, did what we could, and it stayed there for 10 years. So uh, eventually we started changing things out and, and doing <coughs> themed exhibits in those cases, and they got, they got kind of, you know, it was kind of fun. So we had a sports exhibit. We did, um, for Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, we did a 75th anniversary exhibit for Snow White. And uh, we did a 75th anniversary exhibit for the studio itself, showcasing some of the fun stuff that had been there all those years. And then theming them to special films. So we did one for Saving Mr. Banks. And uh, that was really fun to start putting our costumes in there and things. And we still do this. We change these out at least once a year, sometimes a couple times a year if we have enough time. And of course, now they've redone the lobby, so we have a different sign. Uh, but this time we did a, an exhibit honoring our newest acquisitions, which are the things that came from the Fox Studio. The costume collections of the Fox Studio, it, it's a lot of material. And we're integrating it into our collections now. So we did this to honor, you know, welcoming Fox. And so these are all Fox costumes. So there's a costume there from Betty Grable. Uh, the, the poncho there is Julie Andrews' poncho from Sound of Music. Uh, the sweater is uh, Alan Alda's Hawkeye Pierce sweater from MASH. Uh, the pajamas are Tom Hanks' pajamas from Big. And then uh, what's really fun there is the two, the women's costumes. There's one's from Titanic, that's Kate Winslet's from Titanic, and one of the Moulin Rouge costumes that Nicole Kidman wore. And The Greatest Showman, which is fairly new, and Bohemian Rhapsody. So those are both films that came out from Fox very recently. So we wanted to, to showcase these as well and explain that, you know, these are all films that now belong to the Walt Disney Company. Um, so then, going back a little bit, we started the Walt Disney, uh, we started D23 in 2009. And uh, yeah, pretty exciting. Yes, thank you. So 2009 was pretty, pretty exciting. They came to me and said, okay, we're gonna give you a space in the Anaheim Convention Center and we want you to put in an exhibit. And I thought, oh goodness, the public is now gonna see these. So I thought, what am I gonna do? And so we decided we're just gonna present the treasures of the Walt Disney Archives. We're just gonna pick out our crown jewels and put them out there for everybody to see. And I had a meeting room on the second floor of the Anaheim Convention Center. And I thought, well, what am I gonna do? I don't have the you know staff and, and facilities to put you know beautiful sets. And you, know, you go to Disneyland, you see all these amazing things. And we just we had to do this in you know not too long a time and. So I thought we're going to go real simple, and we're going to we're going to do something really really nice. We're just going to put up lots of pla black pipe and drape and really cushy black carpeting, and we built some cases that lit lit up by themselves. And we we actually built these cases ourselves, and um, showcased our treasures. And so we brought the Nautilus and the Sleeping Beauty book and King Brian's crown and all the fun things, and we just did this big room full of lit cases, and it was like a little jewel box. It was really fun. And uh, what was really cool for me is to bring Dave in. And Dave was really excited about this. He, he wasn't into exhibits himself, but you know he was excited that we were able to expand the size of the archives and do these fun things. And so he really got into it, and did a lot of press for us, and he was very happy with our exhibits. Um, two years later, in 2011, we expanded it. We moved into another area within the, the upstairs location and got a little more elaborate with things, and we, we put up some new costumes that we had located, and things like this this blinds from the Green Roger Rabbit, which is really fun. Uh, we also then moved into the room next door, and we filled the room full of sand, and we did a Lost exhibit. Uh, I'll have stories about Lost. I could do a whole episode just on Lost. The freight containers, ocean freight containers coming over from, you know, it's like, See, that's the one thing about the archives. If you take all this stuff, they don't, it's not all cataloged. It's not all, you know, beautifully lined up with labels and things on it. It's more like, okay, you want props from Lost? Here's three ocean freight containers. Just dig through and take what you want. <laughs> and I'm not kidding with that at all. Really, seriously, we have to do that kind of thing. But we did a Lost exhibit, and we put pirates in there, too, and I, I put sand all over the floor, and I'm sure they're still vacuuming <laughs> now. Um, the following year, we decided to do something fun. In 2023, we did a, a toast to the film Oz the Great and Powerful came out, and so we had some really great, great costumes from that film, which is one of my favorite things about that film. And so we wanted to showcase those. So we had the Oz and the witches and everything, and, and the little China doll, and um, that was really fun. And But we also got a chance to throw back some of the older things that we had in the collection. We had the, the patches, the patchwork girl 
from earlier versions, Rainbow Road to Oz was worn by one of the Mouseketeers, Doreen Tracy. We had the model from Rock Candy Mountain, which was originally going to be in the Storybook Land attraction. And then the film Return to Oz, which came out in the 80s, we had some great pieces from that, including the two green costumes there, and um, some of these other things like TikTok, which is really fun, and the Jack Pumpkin head, and things like that. And of course, we had um, the, the, wheelie, the wheeler head, but we also had ruby slippers. And so you have, if you're gonna do Oz, you gotta have the ruby slippers in there, so we did that too. Um, also in that exhibit, what was really fun is we got a chance to do some Mary Poppins stuff. So we had a matte painting, yeah, that's our favorite. You and me, Douglas. Um, so we had Mary's traveling costume, of course, and what was really fun was that we had gotten the uh, Jolly Holiday dress. Uh, it had been on display in Florida at One Man's Dream, and they sent it back to us, and so we had that, and we were able to, we were able to display that for the first and only time that we've displayed that one. It was very fragile. Um, also, I had, had gotten a hold of the Sister Suffragette dress. That was kind of fun. I found it. It's in two pieces. It's an underdress and an overcoat. And um, two different collectors had that dress. So I, I bought the underdress from somebody just on the chance that I might someday find the coat. And I was able to get both pieces and, and we were able to display it for that exhibit. So sometimes I do go out and buy things from auctions, but usually they come from within the company. And then, of course, this was very, very exciting to me because we displayed the carousel horses, but we actually built scenery. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. And what was really cool is that there were other people who saw the exhibit and really liked it. And the Reagan Library, and I'm told that's misspelled, so um, I apologize. I, I didn't get much of a chance to go through this exhibit before I started presenting it tonight, but we, we, we caught that one. Um, but the Reagan Library, R-E-A-G-A-N, um, we do know. So, uh, but we, the Reagan staff came to the expo and saw our exhibit and they loved it. And they said, oh, we want to do that. Can you bring it to the Reagan Library? Well, you know, it was, it was enough to, you know, get everything down to Anaheim, but then to figure out how to get it all up to Simi Valley and put it, you know, on display there was pretty exciting because we'd never traveled any of our exhibits before. So we worked with them for quite a while. It took us about a year to get that exhibit done. And um, when we were ready to go, we took everything up there. So one of the things that we had been given was the head, um, his nickname is Bucky, um, the old dragon head from Fantasmic. And what was really cool is that it had to get from Burbank to Simi Valley. And so it had to be trailered all the way up to um, Simi Valley. <laughs> and what was really fun is that, that somehow, I don't know how this happened, but KTLA News found out that we were doing this and they sent a helicopter. So we actually have footage of, uh, it got the, on the evening news of the, the dragon head going up the five freeway. Pretty exciting. Um, one of the other really cool things that we did at that exhibit for the first time was to put back Walt's office. Now, Walt's office furniture had been taken out after it had been inventoried in the 70s. And it had been shown in various ways. We had it on display in the One Man's Dream uh, attraction at Walt Disney World. There was part of it, the working office. In the Walt Disney Story at Disneyland, it was there for many years, and you could go down, look through the windows, and see the offices. But with the 50th anniversary of Disneyland, they had taken it out and put in a 50th anniversary exhibit, and so all of it had come back to the archives. And so it was really kind of exciting for us to be able to recreate Walt's working off or formal office. And we did so in the Reagan exhibit that year, which was really cool. Now you can see that the, the window, the one funny thing about that is that when you're looking at that, that picture that was always behind the window blinds, um, you were actually looking at a picture of the building that the office was in. <laughs> so that was always amusing. But um, other than that, you know, so we used the original, uh, it, it looked just like the office at Disneyland actually. Put that together. And then we did some other really fun things with different costumes and, and set pieces that we built. Um, sharing all kinds of really fun things. These are from the Annie Leibovitz film, the uh, Tinkerbell and Peter Pan, from the year of, mil of a million dreams. And then of course, we put together the tea party from Alice in Wonderland with the uh, Johnny Depp costume. And uh, of course, that particular exhibit, we had a big space, and so we were able to put pirate ships wow. in there. And that was one of my favorite things. You come down this big staircase, and here's this giant pirate ship out there all lit up. It was really great. Um, speaking of lighting, we had wow. Flynn's Arcade sign. That was the original one from the original Tron. And uh, because it was the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library, we wanted to do some things that were presidentially themed. So we did a little nod to uh, National Treasure. 
And then we had some of the busts of the presidents from uh, the American Adventure, or from, uh, from Magic Kingdom. So we also had some people visiting us from the Museum of Science and Industry who came to the Reagan Library, so they asked if they could have it. So it was like, okay, now what are we gonna do? And so we re-envisioned the whole thing with them and sent it to Chicago. And so it looked a little different there. So we had some different things in there and uh, they built out all this, the scenic design for us. And so you can see it looks a lot different than the Reagan version, which looked a lot different than the uh, Expo version. But it was really kind of fun. And they showed some of the busts of the presidents and we had our small world doll and it was really cool. And of course they wanted to have Walt's office, but there wasn't enough room or, or we couldn't, we we're not gonna travel the piano to Chicago. So we just did Walt's desk. So we traveled Walt's desk with the, uh, with the different uh, objects. And of course the little bird, which has to be in, I think every exhibit we do now. <laughs> and then of course, the international people got interested. So every time somebody comes to an expo, we get a call. It's like, oh, can you bring your exhibit to Japan now? And that was really exciting. Um, in 2011, Disney Japan created an exhibit of their own celebrating the 110th anniversary of Walt Disney's birth, which I thought was kind of interesting because it took them too long to create the exhibit and they had to do it on the 111th birthday of Walt. <laughs> and so I, I just kept referring to it as the 111st birthday. And they, didn't, they didn't get it, but you know, I amused myself. Um, so they asked us if we would loan some objects from our collections, and we did. Um, and they really appreciated that. So then, but the next year in 2013, they asked us if we would do a complete exhibit for them and they wanted a treasures exhibit of their own. So we did, we worked with them to create a lovely exhibit and uh, it was a huge success. And so we have things here from Saving Mr. Banks, um, princesses, they, they like the destiny and beauty and romance. And it's really lovely. And the, it was just, the, the little girls in Japan were just giddy over the, the princess dresses, I have to say, it was just very adorable. Uh, but they were huge, hugely attended. They, the, the Japanese people were really excited. And I have to explain to you something here. If you look at this picture, the Japanese people who come to these exhibits love to read every word. Every single word we put up there, they read it. And uh, we, we know that they don't do that here in the US. So we cut down on some of the verbiage in the, in the exhibits. But if you need to know more about anything that's on those walls, we have it. But they, they do, they read everything. They, they go from panel to panel, they read everything we put in there. So it's kind of fun. Uh, that summer in 2015, same year, I got a call from the Japan office asking for help. They, they said, this was, I think, probably I think it happened in May, May or June of, of 2015. And they called me and said, um, you know, August is International Honey Bee Day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, got it. Pooh, Winnie the Pooh. They asked if we could do a Winnie the Pooh exhibit to celebrate <laughs> International Honey Bee Day. And I said, well, next August? No, no, this August. It's like, you want me to put together a traveling international exhibit in three months? Are you kidding? But they, they begged, and so we worked with them on it, and we actually got it done. Uh, we sent most, it was mostly imagery and, and small objects because they just couldn't get it all there in time. But what was really interesting about it is their reasoning. It was the marketing team from Japan, and they called and wanted to do this exhibit because in Japan, the, the uh, people of Japan know Winnie the Pooh very well. They love Winnie the Pooh. But they weren't as familiar with Winnie the Pooh's friends and the Hundred Acre Wood. And, they, and the merchandising people, they're like, we want to sell you know, <laughs> toys that have Eeyore on, and they don't know who Eeyore is. Can you help us? And so. We thought, okay, so we did this exhibit specifically to explain the story behind Winnie the Pooh and who his friends were. And it was really cute, and it was so exciting, it was so successful that they asked us then if we could send it to Hong Kong, which we did. And I think eventually um, we, we sent, we may have sent it to Taiwan, I can't remember, but we did send it to Hong Kong. And um, it, it just was really fun, very whimsical, and of course very yellow. Um, <laughs> but it was really fun. And, and I, when they asked, we sent them samples of, of artwork that they could put on the walls. Like they wanted to see drawings. It was like, okay, well here's, we sent them, you know, 40 drawings and said, here you go, you pick from this. And they came back with, we want all of them. <laughs> I said, are you kidding? And that's, that's what we did. So they loved it. Um, so another, uh, a couple years later, then they, they called us and said, we want to do this again. And now we want to do a princess exhibit. We want to teach girls that beauty is only skin deep and that it's the power that's within that is what's important. And it was a, a big lesson that, that they're trying to 
to focus on in Japan. And so they asked us for our princess uh, costumes and, and ephemera and things. And so we did a, a beautiful princess exhibit and focused on, on all the different princesses and their, their own attributes. So like whether it's uh, courage or kindness, things like that. And, and of course then showed our pretty costumes too. And um, I love these Cinderella displays that they did. Um, Watanabe-san is, is their designer over there, and he's an amazing designer. And he just does these really beautiful window displays and things. And so we have the, this is the uh, wedding dress and uh, the princess costume from Cinderella. So heading back to the United States uh, in 2015, we got a real exciting thing. We got to go downstairs onto the show floor at the expo. <laughs> and so we were given 12, thousand square feet to fill and um, that was pretty exciting it was the 50th anniversary of Disneyland that year so we decided to take all of our assets from Disneyland and, and build a big and better huge exhibit and so we shared little things like our ticket number one which you recently saw in the exhibit um, and but we also showed some ride vehicles we had the prototype and the ride vehicle from Alice in Wonderland and some of the characters um, we brought our Yeti, which is pretty exciting because he's awfully large. Dave would never have taken him because he didn't fit in a box. Um, but it was pretty exciting to have him there, and Dave even liked it too. He was like, that's pretty cool. Um, we put it with a bobsled. Now this one is one costume that was on that rack of 15 costumes. It was Bobbo the Clown, and uh, he was from the Mickey Mouse Club Circus, which was the first year at Disneyland. And uh, of course, when I saw that, I had no idea what a babo was, but I, I learned. I learned all about it and put him in the exhibit. Um, fun things like you know, and the, the heads and the props. <laughs> and America Sings, that's the greatest thing ever. I miss it very much. And then of course, we brought things from parades, including the Main Street Electrical Parade. We were able to get a float that lit up. Um, but the most exciting thing in 2015 was um, restoring Walt's office. So I've mentioned that before, but um, we were given permission. Uh, it was it had been kind of a dream of mine ever since I found out that the archives had all this stuff and that Walt's office was still up on the third floor of the animation building. I had always thought, wouldn't it be great to put it back in and go in there and be where Walt had you know, created so many amazing things. And so I had kind of kicked the idea around. I told my boss, I really want to do that. And he said, that's a great idea. We should do that. And you know, we just always kind of talked about it. One day we were walking across the parking lot with Bob Iger, and as everyone does, we all glanced up at Walt's office at the same time to look at it up on the third floor in the corner. And God bless Stephen, he said, you know, Bob, we have all the objects in that office. We have everything. We can put it all back together if we wanted to. And Bob said, well, why don't we? <laughs> so, okay, so he said, put together a, pro a you know, put together a proposal. So I sat down and I, put it all together and we talked to the mill and we figured out how much it was gonna cost and called Bob and he said okay and gave us the green light and paid for it all and uh, God bless him. So now we have the office and you can actually go in there. So if you haven't had a tour of the studio, the D23 tours, you gotta go and do it because it's the most impressive and inspiring thing you can imagine and I still, every time I walk in there, I just, I get chills. Uh, for those of you who haven't been here, this is a picture of Walt Disney's office and this is what it looked like after his passing in the early 70s when Dave was inventorying it. So that's what it looked like. And then when I got my hands on it, it looked like that, which is was Mark Cherry's office, and he liked cherry red, obviously. And so that's what it looked like, and we made it look like that <laughs> instead. So we put it back, and that's an office window. So today, thank you. So here's a few before and after. So that's the Waltz. That's Mark Cherry's. <laughs> And that's what we have today. So we had to do a lot of paneling. We had to cover a lot of red paint. We moved some doors back to where they originally belonged. We took out a skylight. We did all kinds of fun things in there. And then we did the same thing to Walt's working office. So this is what it looked like when Walt was there. And that's what it looked like when it was a conference room for the producers, for Mark and his group. And uh, that's what it looks like now. So we even found curtains. They even had the same curtains, pretty cool. This is another view of that same room. And uh, that's what it looked like when we got up there. And this is what it looks like today. So you can see there's a major difference. 
Uh, one of the interesting things about it is that, of course, there's that kitchen there that opens and closes, so you can see that it opens there. Uh, one of the things we had to do, though, is if you see that partition there, it's on the, my right here, um, that side, that had to be replaced. Um, it was there when Walt was there, but it had been torn out long before. We had to rebuild that, but what was it was hiding was um, there's a hallway there that now you go through and you go into to Walt's private space, and um, they had turned that into a bathroom, so it was an executive washroom, and so I ripped out that. I tore the whole thing out and put a, put a hallway back in, and, and then hid it, <laughs> so that was fun. Uh, another thing we had to do was make the kitchen look like it did in the old days, and so we put in a lot of, of different uh, materials, but the same cupboards are still there, and they still light up, and we got some prop, prop uh, V8 juice and canned chili and hash and all the things that Walt used to like to keep in his, his stock there and put them back in. So that's Mike Buckoff, our, our photo ma our manager of the photo library. And of course, the last room that we did was Walt's private space, which looked like this when we moved in there. They were using it as a reception area and we turned it into a small gallery because we didn't have those, those pieces. They had disappeared long before. They weren't saved. So we had an empty room there and we decided to make it a rotating gallery. So we do exhibits in there that we change out about once a year. So another big dream of mine, Walt's office was of course a big dream, but I love pirates. I love pirates, I like anything pirates from Alice, Alice comedies to you know uh, Captain Hook and Peter Pan and up through uh, the Pirates of the Caribbean attractions and of course the new movies and so uh, we got to do a big pirate exhibit in 2017 on the show floor at the Expo and brought in lots of big pirate ships. It was really fun. Lots of special lighting and music effects and fog and it was awesome. And uh, so we got to bring some big things too. So some of those things were really huge. We had to have our own 53 foot trailer just for the Black Pearl to bring it down to the, uh, to the building. But we got it in there and then uh, managed to put in a whole lot of things. Did anybody who saw this exhibit? It was one of my favorites. It was so much fun to do. But boy, we had a lot of work getting all that stuff down there. <laughs> it was crazy. And I had to restore a few pieces. This organ was the Davy Jones organ from, from the Flying Dutchman. And it's made of foam. It's all styrofoam. And it had to be touched up and painted. And that took, took some doing. Uh, lots of costumes and props. And a lot of foliage. Lots and lots of foliage. <laughs> and. Uh, it was all real. It was fun. They brought just truckloads of plants in for us, uh, some models and things like that. And then also we showed, like I said earlier, pirates. So we had a ride vehicle from pirate from Peter Pan, and had some pieces, original pieces from the Pirates of the Caribbean attractions. We had some AA figures and had a pig. Everybody's got to have a pig in every exhibit. Um, the dog with the keys. Yeah, fun stuff. And then a nod to some more recent pirates. These were uh, from Once Upon a Time and from uh, some of those films from the Disney Channel and, and things like that. So we showed modern pirates too. Now because we didn't have enough to do with that pirate exhibit, um, <laughs> we got a phone call and said, oh, we want you to do a little a costume exhibit too. I'm like, really? I said, like, yeah, put it up there. So we, we thought, well, we'll let's pull some of our gowns and, we'll, and I've always also wanted to do a big costume exhibit. So I thought, well, this is a way to just test out the, the waters here. And so we brought six gowns and, and displayed them as fantastical fashions. So here's uh, from Enchanted, there's Enchanted and from Beauty and the Beast and Cinderella. And then on the opposite side, we put some of our better villains like Cruella de Vil and the Queen of Hearts and of course Maleficent. So we had the dark and light. And everybody really loved this. And so that's where I got uh, approval to do the big costume exhibit, the following expo. And I uh, think it's our bosses really loved that. Now, during this, we're doing our biannual exhibits at D23, but we also were traveling, and that's the interesting thing about this too, is that when we send our objects to a, an exhibit, whether it's in the United States or somewhere else, we always, it's called couriering. So we are always the courier of our exhibits. We curate them. Even if we're just loaning it to another exhibit, we take it there and physically install it ourselves. And this is an exhibit in Melbourne, Australia, that was um, all about one, it's called Wonderland. And so we took some of our assets, they called and asked if they could borrow some things from uh, the Tim Burton Alice in Wonderland costumes that we had. And so we, we took that down there. And we had to send somebody to Australia. He had to go down to install it and then had to go back about six months later and deinstall it, bring it all back. But that's something too, is our staff actually physically goes to all these places and handles the assets ourselves. And that's what we do to protect these pieces because we don't want anything to happen to them. And 
believe me, you know, some people you can trust to take good care of your stuff, and some people promise you all kinds of things, and then, you know, it's not a good thing when they fall apart. Um, but that was a really fun exhibit, and Rick got to go to Australia twice, so he, he enjoyed that. Uh, speaking of traveling with assets, uh, I do uh, regularly do the Disney Vacation Club member cruise, which they do every year, and they asked me several years ago if I would bring some treasures onto the cruise ship, so they built me some little cases. Now, of course, by necessity, I have to take small things because I have to hand carry them on the plane to, the, to Florida, um, but we do these little exhibits, and so it's fun. We took some pirate's assets. We do our little cases, and we do them out in the Walt Disney Theater lobby on the ship. That's really fun. We took peg leg, peg leg bird and original tickets and things. It's really fun. So now, speaking of traveling, also for Mickey's 90th birthday, Disney Consumer Products did a mega pop-up store called Mickey True Original. They did an ex exhibition in New York City and asked us to participate. So we helped them with developing the whole exhibit. But our particular uh, contribution to this one was to um, put in a sampling of, of rare merchandise. So we had a whole big room there that we went and installed and did, uh, did merchandise, history of mer Mickey merchandise. Another group that we work with often is the FIDM, which is the Fashion Institute of Design and Manufacturing. It's a school in Los Angeles downtown. And every year they do two major exhibits and they do um, art of motion picture and television costume design. So in the early spring, they do all of the nominees of the Academy Awards, all the costume design, all the films that are designed, uh, given a nomination. And then in the summer, they do one for the Emmys and they do uh, films that are awarded for television. And so we always go down there. We've been doing it for about 15 years now. And so we, we loan them costumes from our films. So this year, this is from this year, we did, um, of course, Aladdin which came out last year, and Ford versus Ferrari, which is from the Fox studio, which was more recent. Uh, Dumbo, some beautiful costumes from Dumbo, from Tim Burton's Dumbo. And then, of course, uh, Maleficent II, some beautiful costumes. And uh, one that you don't think of with Disney, this was Jojo Rabbit, <laughs> which got nominated, but it's also a Fox film. And so speaking of costumes, we, we finally got to do our big costume exhibit in 2019. And uh, we did Heroes and Villains, The Art of Disney Costuming. And this was really fun. Did, a lot of you have seen this one. This was last, last year. And we were really excited about it because we were able to make brand new custom-made mannequins and uh, just did some really great, interesting things with it and posing mannequins and stuff like that and a lot of lighting. And, and it was just a really fun exhibit. And we also, for the first time, published a book to go along with it. So Disney Editions published our costumes in a book. And so, shameless plug, it's in the museum store. If you haven't bought your copy, run now. No, wait till I'm finished, but run. And uh, just a, a little hint, there's lots of, uh, everybody. <laughs> yes, I have a book in there too. But you have all the staff of the Walt Disney Archives here, so if you want to get some signatures in it, it's just a great opportunity. Um, by the way, too, we started our traveling exhibition program with this exhibit. We're also ex uh, gonna be traveling this exhibit uh, opening at MOPOP, which is the Museum of Popular Culture in uh, Seattle. And uh, that'll be coming out, it'll start in October. So this exhibit will f travel on. We haven't, we, we haven't announced our next venue for this exhibit yet, but um, both exhibits will be traveling around the U.S. probably for the next few years. And uh, I want to share a little bit about the, the exhibit that you're here, you saw today. Uh, it was called Inside the Walt Disney Archives in Japan also. And looked a little different. Um, I'm going to kind of zip through these because there's a lot of them. But uh, this it was first done in the Miracosta Hotel Ballroom at the Tokyo Disney Sea Resort, and uh, it looked a little bit different. Um, like I said, it was done with the Japanese sensibility too, and was trying to ex kind of explaining the connections between Disney. And it was also focusing on films that the Japanese are the most familiar with. There's a lot of Disney films that that you all know that they've never heard of. And also they have some really films that they're particularly interested in. We're like, really? You want us to put that in the exhibit? Because they just love some of these films. And so it was really kind of fun to, to look at what they like. So um, we replicated the experience of, of going into the archives and their team came out here to see what we do. We took them to all our facilities and they drew up these wonderful dimensional uh, renderings and things. I'm gonna skip through these. They did a lot of vignettes. So we got Beauty and the Beast, uh, Alice in Wonderland, uh, 101 Dalmatians, of course, Pirates of the Caribbean, 
and uh, the Haunted Mansion. So some of these you can see that actually was in Japan and it was almost brought back here exactly the same. Uh, they wanted to see things from Aladdin and they were very interested in Tron. And uh, so it was, it was kind of fun. So they, they did this, this whole thing and they did the legends. Uh, they focused on some of the legends that were most popular in Japan like Stan Lee and Steve Jobs and um, George Lucas, all of whom represented films that they really love over there. So we did uh, something very similar. And now this is the, the main showcase of the Walt Disney Archives. This was an exhibit we have. And this is the Frank Wells Lobby. And of course, this is what they did for the Japan exhibit. You can see that it's in a ballroom. You can see all the, the lighting and, and the interesting carpeting and things like that. Um, but they did it in there. Now they wanted to do, because this came out uh, the same year as Mickey's 90th anniversary, and so they wanted to do an overlay of Mickey Mouse and put some special Mickey Mouse pieces in there. So we added those, so we have, this is the, the book that Walt reads, It All Started With a Mouse, and he has that on television, so that, that's something we have in the archives. And so we did a lot of Mickey theming. Uh, but the, the thing that was very different about this exhibit was how it ended. Uh, we wanted to do a tribute to the people of Japan and include some Japanese assets. And so we had collections from Japanese fans, their collectibles, and but the very the most special piece, and this is how we ended the exhibit in Japan, uh, and it was truly spectacular for these folks, is that we had the guest book from Disneyland that was signed by Emperor Hirohito when he visited in 1975. And it took months and months to get approval because we had to actually go to the new Emperor of Japan and ask his permission to put it in the exhibit. And he said yes, but you can't take any photos of it. Um, so the guests that were there were not allowed to take photos of the piece in, in the exhibit. But you see there we have photos of, of their visit to Japan, or from Japan in 1975. So that particular exhibit, like I said, started in Burbank, and then uh, here's a little tour of what happened to it. So we went to Tokyo Disneyland where we had the expo, and then we took it to Osaka. And then from Osaka, it went back to Tokyo to a new venue. And then from Tokyo, we decided to send it to Yokohama. And then from Yokohama, it went to Fukuoka. And from Fukuoka, it went up to Sapporo. And then it, this, they decided to send it back down to Nagoya. And then from Nagoya, and they added another venue and sent it to Shizuoka. And then from Shizuoka, it came to Santa Ana, California. So it's here today. It changed a little bit between there and here, but it's the same basic exhibit. Um, so just wanted to thank you for sharing this, this look back at our exhibit's history. And just because I have a couple more minutes, I want to show you uh, something pretty special. I, I just really want to show you how glamorous this world of exhibitions really truly is. So here's some behind the scenes photography of what it takes to put our exhibits in. And um, sometimes it requires lifting up things or crawling under desks or carrying heavy loads. Sometimes it gets messy, but uh, the staff loves what they do. Um, one of the exhibits that we did uh, is the Disneyland exhibit that we, we did, and we took uh, time-lapse photos. We took photography, and so the time-lapse is going. So this is how we're going to end our exhibit here, is to show you what goes into making one of these exhibits work. And it's a lot of, a lot of physical labor, a lot of unloading trucks, and uh, a lot of fun. <laughs> Zone drill. Where's the drill? Where's the drill? I don't know. Where? <laughs> this is over a couple a couple days. So thank you again for sharing this little walk back through memory lane with me. And uh, now I know I'm so tired. But thank you all for coming. And now Thank you so much.